So welcome everyone, good to see you. Um, so this week's topic is alignment. And today in particular, it's almost, it's all about uh, the alignment of body and mind. Uh, you've heard in the meditation just now, me saying that you're gonna bring your body and your mind together. Uh, the body is already here so we let go of thinking about something else and we bring the mind back we're experiencing what is right here right now so essentially this is what i mean when i say to align body and mind there's another layer to that too of course but i won't be discussing that today but next uh, next class on thursday and the other layer is because that you align your mind your intentions and your actions what you do in the physical world with your body and what you think on the inside. So for most people, these are two separate things. We act very differently often from what we think and what we hold on the inside. So for example, you might really dislike someone, but on the outside you pretend that you really like them. Or you might, well, again on social media, of course, you might have <coughs> the ability with a filter to pretend that your life is really awesome and you're really really good at what you do when in reality you're at home depressed so very often uh, we have this discrepancy between our inner world what we think inside and how we display ourselves on the outside world that is also very often reflected on the public self the way you present yourself when you're amongst people that you don't know very orderly very nice and the way you behave when you're back at home and nobody watches you. That might also be very different, right? The way you behave with your closest friends and the way you behave with strangers in a waiting room or in a meditation class like this, it's very different. So there is always this discrepancy. That is one way of aligning. We will discuss that on Thursday a bit more, but uh, today it's about the type of alignment that uh, suggests that you practice presence, that you know what is happening while it is happening, that you know yourself right here, right now. And so for most of us, this is not the case. For most of us, we're continuously mentally elsewhere. So for example, we have a shower in the morning and the mind uh, is already at work. Like how you will handle things in the office, how you will confront certain people with certain issues, what you might post on Facebook later on. So there's, these, there's this kind of alignment that's super important. In our practice, we wanna always strive to unite the body and the mind. It means your body is already always here, isn't it? The body is kind of like waiting for you. It's right here, right now, waiting for your mind to come home. And the mind likes to travel a lot. It likes to go elsewhere. And for some people, it is going so far that we're so much up in our heads, so caught up in our thoughts, that we forget the body to such a degree that the body can only bring the mind back with pain. Like, for example, by getting ill or getting chronic stress, fatigue, or just noticing that you've been hunching over your computer screen for two hours without noticing your body and all of a sudden your shoulders are saying, hey, come back, here's a body that you need to take care of, that you need to look after. And in these days, of course, then we have a lot of these kind of problems. We get absorbed in media very often, like there's so many interesting things that you can watch online that we can completely forget our bodies for a long time. Always strikes me to see how easy it is to sit still through a two-hour movie in one chair but if we are supposed to sit still for 15 minutes with ourselves it's unbearable for most people they want to go elsewhere they can't wait for the alarm to go off when does it end oh god my knees are killing me but in the movies no problem or we can have conversations with our friends like long conversations sitting on one chair and one table is not a problem we, forget the body completely, right? 
because we are enjoying ourselves in that moment. So the body becomes secondary. The mind is filled with interest. It's filled with joy. It's busy with something. It has a job to do. The mind always wants to have a job to do. Was something to do. It wants something to get lost in, right? And so it goes at the beginning very much against the grain, the practice, it's real spiritual practice. It's not about fabricating some fantastic reality in your mind and holding to certain belief sets, you know, like I believe in, I don't know, I believe in this and that. Um, my opinion is this and that. It's not about that. It's not about creating opinions or beliefs or follow a certain dogma or a certain tradition. It's much more about really seeing the way it is, getting to know the way it is. And then gradually learning to be at peace with the way it is. See, we're not trying to make the way it is into something peaceful. We're simply learning to be at peace with what is. And we can't learn that if we're constantly mentally trying to get elsewhere and distract ourselves from what is. It makes us also highly inefficient at living our life. Think of a conversation that you have with a friend. Picture your friend continuously while you're talking with him or her, continuously looking at their phone or looking elsewhere or yawning, basically signaling with body language that he can't wait for you to stop talking. How welcome do you feel? You're not feeling welcomed, right? You feel like, uh, almost like you're rejected because the other person is unable to pay attention for two or three seconds and to listen to you actually fully. They're already thinking of their answers they will give you when you're finished talking. They can't wait for you to finish your sentence so they can say their thing and then you can listen to them. And then you have to listen to them and of course we also don't like to listen to other people. We want them to listen to us. And so it's a back and forth a conversation like this very often. Mentally, we're already in the next moment. Mentally, we're not here. For example, I might be giving this talk mentally already thinking about what I will say next. It will completely destroy the talk. It will make it really inefficient, really boring, really like not a life. It's not out of the moment. It's not relevant. And what life actually asks us, it is, it asks for you to connect with it. It asks for you to see it. Those who can connect with life, um, they have an advantage. If you can connect with life, life can actually support you. It becomes a supportive force. It can nourish you. It can carry you. And it doesn't very much feel like, oh, Life is a thing that I have that I must make sure that I run properly. It's almost like something in my pocket. Life is something that I have in my pocket and I must make sure that it functions properly. Something like that. That's very heavy. Life becomes a very heavy thing that we carry around with ourselves on our backs. So my life when all we are carrying around in that very moment is just a bunch of thoughts about my life, but not life. As Eckhart Tolle puts it very nicely, he says, uh, you don't have a life, you are life. And we tend to forget that. We feel very much like somebody that must control life. Well, let's have a look if that is actually true. If life is something that you must make work out. Are you growing your hair? Really contemplate it. Is it you doing this? Are you sitting down every morning consciously like growing my hair? 
a little bit each day, a little bit more, pushing the hair out. So you're doing that? If you're drinking water, are you the one making the, the, the reflex that you can swallow the water and it goes down? Are you the one doing this or is it just a reflex? Imagine you actually would have to do this consciously. Imagine you would have to run your kidneys. You have to make sure that they run properly. We'd be lost, totally lost. We'd, we'd drop dead in no time. Imagine you had to be the one that reproduces your cells or runs the nervous system or makes sure that the hormones are nicely balanced. We could never do that, any of it. Fortunately, your body does all that even while you're totally gone asleep in dreamland. Your body still does what it does best probably most efficiently at night because you're gone you're not interfering with it so the body heals during during deep sleep right and so observing the way our body actually behaves that within i think it's it's a scientific statement i'm not entirely sure about actually whether it's valid or not but i've heard it several times we say that within 7 years the whole body has basically exchanged. Every atom in your body has completely exchanged with other atoms, with other cells. So there's not one cell in your body left after seven years. A completely new body. Of course, that goes gradual. It's not like a sudden thing after seven years, you suddenly have a new body. But it's a gradual process of exchange, constant exchange. Our bodies are in constant exchange with the environment with the food, with the people that we spend time with. It's highly complex. This entire universe is extremely complex. It's mind-boggling. It's beyond thought. It's beyond comprehension. It's very profound, the way things work. So this whole idea that I am, it's my body and I'm running the show, basically, is funny, actually. When we're not doing one little thing even in this body, we're doing nothing in this body. Fortunately, let's add that. What's the same thing with the mind? Even the mind doesn't do what you want it to do. You want it to be happy and well and at ease. And no, it doesn't do that. <laughs> Instead, it gives us insomnia, depression, worries, fears, all that unpleasant stuff that nobody wants, but it's still there. Why? If it is really your mind, if it's really under my domain, it's my thing, doesn't ownership really also suggest a certain amount of control? If I say I own this house over there, I can say that, it's my house over there, but actually no paperwork has been signed, I haven't paid for it, I just say it, then I can say that as many times as I want, the fact that I don't have this house is proven by the fact that I do not have control over it in any way. Someone else has control over it. I don't. But I can still say it's my house. Talking is cheap, right? I can say it's my house. But the fact is not, it's not my house. It doesn't really belong to me. Right? The same is true with the body. I can say it's my body. Well, it's my mind, but is it really? <laughs> Wouldn't it suggest control? So then I tell my mind, please be happy for the rest of the day. I would like to really enjoy my day today and feel great. The mind says, no, you should keep in mind this thing and that thing and you should worry about this and you should you know think about other things that are unpleasant the mind just doesn't listen it gives me all these things that I don't want to think about how come if it is really my mind right? it's not my mind it's just a mind it's not my thoughts it's just thoughts it's not my body, it is just a body. 
like a tree, like wind, like water, like atoms. It's just more atoms in this universe coming together in this shape for a little while. And that's okay. Now I bring my attention to it. And I bring my attention to it in such a way that I can actually experience what I'm talking about right now. I come back to experience life and aliveness as such like a miracle again. It's not this ordinary thing that I have to run, but it's something absolutely amazing. How comes that we have this body and we walk around every day, day in and day out, and we're not totally mind blown by it? How comes that we're taking it for granted that we're living on a round ball in the middle of infinite space, billions, trillions of light years in expanse? There I am in my body here, you know, sitting in this room in this world, in this realm that I experience, and yeah, it's totally normal. I don't even think about it. I'm not even aware of it, because mentally I have to think about all my problems that I'm having, and weigh myself down by it. But is that really true? Is that really the way we are supposed to live our lives? Weighed down by the weight of our own thoughts, which could be any kind of thought. Could be negative thoughts, could be positive thoughts. Aren't you the one who could choose the way you think? So anyways, coming back to uniting body and mind, what is the point of this? Why to do this? Because first of all, it trains the mind in stability. That's very basic stuff. It brings some stability into the mind. When the mind enjoys more stability, it feels more happy. It has more direction, it has more power. If the mind has no direction and stability, it's completely dispersed all the time, it has no power. The difference between a powerful mind and a weak mind is in stability. How stable is your attention? How sustained is your mind on one thing? If you see that the mind is re really flimsy, it's a flimsy thing, it goes everywhere all the time, it's totally dispersed, that's the reason why we're generally unhappy. We have no power inside. It's deflated. And so by bringing your attention to what is, and in keeping your attention there, you're building power, and you're allowing for life to nourish you in that moment by just simply being aware of life, of the aliveness inside of your body, the aliveness surrounding you in this very moment, you're nourished by it. You're building strength. And if you can stay there, the building of strength goes up to a point where you actually start to feel it. You start to feel really, really good. Your body feels happy, your mind feels great, you're in good health, you feel balanced, at ease, wherever you are. That's a benefit of bringing together the body and the mind, training that throughout the whole day. Not just uh, every now and then, like once a week, I take like 15 minutes to sit down and bring body and mind together. That won't do any difference. Nothing will come from that. Then we could equally also just take a nap. It's probably more efficient than trying to sit down and focus for 15 minutes and then, uh, you know, after 15 minutes having another week of distraction. <laughs> so it's important to have build a regular habit of actually bringing our attention back to what is. And we would only ever do that either because we really understand the benefits and it motivates us. Oh yeah, I really want to do this because it makes me happier, it makes me more at ease. To experience myself not as a problem but as life.
Or we can also contemplate the downfalls of not doing that or simply be motivated by an overdose of suffering. Maybe we've really had enough. Most people come to meditation because they are suffering. They've had enough. Constantly worrying, constantly scared, constantly imbalanced. What can I do? How do I get out of this? And then they find the book about meditation or they hear something, a friend mentioning to them, you know, you should try some meditation. It'll help, it'll do you some good, you know. And then they start. That's thanks to suffering. Suffering, as I said many times, has the function of being an alarm clock. It wakes you up. It could simply wake you up to the fact that the way you sit is harmful for your body. So it gives you pain. But it says, look, you should change, otherwise you will really hurt yourself. Then the body's alarm system shows you here that it's not a good way of sitting. It might be stress. What does stress tell you? Wait, simply, the, the way you live your life is not healthy. And if you keep going that way, where does that lead? Well, it leads to burnout. It leads to a complete exhaustion, complete shutdown of everything. The way we live nowadays, when you're tired, what do you do? What comes to mind? Oh, I'm so tired. I could go and have a nap that would be super intelligent, yes? But many people think of a cup of coffee, maybe, yeah? I could have a coffee, a Red Bull, whatever, you know, like... So I can continue functioning. And we do that mentally, too. Oh, I'm unhappy. How could I distract myself so I can keep functioning? We have these genius distraction uh, m methods at our disposal nowadays. We can distract ourselves endlessly. It's a whole world of distraction out there waiting for you to get lost in. And with each minute that we spend ignoring ourselves, we become more and more empty on the inside, more and more unhappy. This is a vicious cycle because the more unhappy you are, the more distraction you need. And to, for some people it goes to the point where they shut down. It just doesn't work anymore. And then oh, no way out, seemingly. Or maybe it's then really time to go in, not out anymore. So your only way out is in. And that's when we direct our attention to the inside and we become aware of our mind, we become aware of our emotional being, we become aware of, oh, wow, here I am, alive. Breathing in, breathing out, and the heart is beating, and the brain is firing. And the more you look, the more you see what, a, what an odd and amazing thing it is to be sitting here in this flesh bone body. Why is your body not made of plastic or metal? Why is it this kind of weird material? Why is it that we sit in this world surrounded by green, hairy or hair-like things like trees? We call it trees. Why is there wind, water? Why are we not floating? Why are we stuck to the ground? Why are we heavy, not light? This is all inviting you to look, to pay attention to it. The more you pay attention to it, the more efficiently you will lead your life. I would say that the person who is able to be completely present with what is, is adding quality to the situation, whatever situation it is. Picture your conversation again. 
your friend instead of ignoring you or thinking about the next thing being mentally absent is now paying full attention to you you can sense that quality you feel loved you feel welcomed you feel understood it'll be so nice to spend time with your friends quality and it's such a simple difference anything you do if you actually pay attention to what you do gets better your doing becomes better more powerful and if you're in a relationship and you're holding each other you're giving each other a hug try to be fully present with the other person give just give it a shot stop thinking about yourself for a moment you know why kindness is so beautiful why it makes you so happy it's just for a moment you're not thinking of yourself that's what gives us happiness and what makes us miserable is self the more we are self-absorbed the more unhappy we are what's the pinnacle of self-absorption how is it called it's called depression it's so much me it's like a black hole too much me you totally forget everything around you it's only me and my pain me and my pain me and my pain me and my pain you zoom in me and my pain everything outside of you becomes invisible it can be a beautiful sunrise sunset some wind on your skin you can't even feel it anymore impossible because all you feel is me and my pain that is depression is the pinnacle of self-absorption what's the opposite kindness expansion an open heart a heart which is not self-absorbed but it sees oh in the world I'm not alone but there are many and it's an us that's there and we all suffer and nobody wants to and so you can share your light you can share your happiness your joy because you look after yourself in case of depression or the route into depression we don't do that we don't look it's so self-absorbed we we are so aggressively against ourselves in a way that uh, th there is no room for taking care of yourself or looking after yourself anymore you can't it, it's too too weak there's no more energy left to look after yourself to lift yourself out of bed in the morning even the simplest tasks become heavy burdens there's no more energy the mind has no energy left it's all lost in the black hole of self and so taking care looking after yourself actually lifting yourself up is at the base of kindness and you do that by receiving your body get in touch with your body mentally fill your body with awareness unite body and mind bring them together again is your greatest power that you have particularly in the beginning of the path you unite body and mind again and again gently embracing the body with your awareness looking after it relaxing it and the way I do this for myself is very simple throughout the day I just remember that oh I'm here right now I'm sitting here like this then I breathe in and I really feel my body as I breathe in and I breathe in slowly really becoming sensitive to the body and as I breathe out I let go of all the tension that's there look at my shoulders how how high up they were and how much they can still relax so instead of holding the tension I release the tension as I breathe out and there's many layers of tension in the body as well emotional tension you know tension in the deeper areas of the body feel become sensitive to your body breathing in slowly feeling the body getting in touch with your body your body will absolutely love that it will give you energy as a result you give it attention your body gives you energy
it's like you're looking after someone. You look after someone, that person will give you gratitude and love and affection and warmth. It's natural, isn't it? So by paying attention to something, you feed it. And that also applies to negativity. You might pay attention to, to your pain in the body, for example. How are you paying attention? Is pain allowed to exist in your life? Or is it not allowed to exist? Well, if it's not allowed to exist, you're going to have a whole lot of problems with your body because the body is harboring a lot of pain. Lots of itches, lots of things going on in the body. So we've got to learn to be a bit more comfortable with it. Ah, there's pain. It is allowed to be there. We breathe in, we really feel it. And as we breathe out, we gradually help releasing it. We get out of the way. We literally heal the body like this. We help a healing process. And at the same time, when you do that, for three breaths, during those three breaths, you are here as a person not having any problems. You're just breathing in, you feel, you breathe out, you relax. And if you do that for three times, for that moment, maybe that's three seconds or a bit more, 15 seconds maybe, 20 seconds, that's 20 seconds of your day, you not having any problems. You're not being a walking problem that needs to be solved. For that, you're just present. It's a very nice presence. Anybody who is dropping their problems or is able to drop their problems, even for a little while, is a blessing to the world. Imagine that scenario when someone approaches another person shouting at them, y you're an idiot. And the other person doesn't respond with pain, but the other person relaxes and understands and actually listens. But there is another being that hurts, that's in pain. Maybe I can help, maybe not. But there is not double the pain you see what I mean? That's the way we can actually solve problems. But if both are aggressive, no, you are the idiot, no, you are the idiot, then that's like an endless uh, chaos. So if one only is present, it's already a big relief. That's where the problems end. That's where the pain can go. And all that through that very simple practice of really uniting your body and your mind, bringing your awareness, your attention kindly into your body. Your body is waiting for it. It's hungry for it. It asks you so many times to pay attention to it. And by not neglecting it anymore, it will give you back so much vitality, aliveness, a feeling of joy, of comfort in your own body, of ease. You have a good relationship with your body. That doesn't mean that you have to like your looks. That's not what that means. Having a good relationship with your body means that you're kindly giving it attention. Not the most expensive care products but attention, one of the most healing forces in this world, is paying attention to each other, paying attention to ourselves, isn't it? It's a simple thing, nothing complex, and very practical, I feel. It's not like some deep, profound, philosophical com complex. It's just really simple, really basic. Here you are. Your body is waiting for you. Can you rest with it together? 
Can you let go of all of your head problems for a little moment? That's a gateway to peace. It's short, it's crisp, it's neat. You can all do it. Everyone can do it. Like that we all look after ourselves. And I hope that this talk somehow inspired you guys to do that a bit more. To look after yourself, to be with your body there, to drop all the problems in the head for a little moment. Take a few deep breaths and just relax in your body. Drop the tension. And maybe you can do that often enough and long enough that you get a taste for it until you don't even want to pick up your problems after that anymore. You realize that you also can live without them. So that's all that comes to mind for today. Are there any questions?